Good morning. Good morning. And in case and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Already? Oh yeah, no, but because the people can watch it at any time. Exactly. Well, who you says know what that again? You know, you don't know what that's from. Oh, well, I you might remember. can't remember right now. I know it's from something. The Truman Show. Oh, that's right. Yes, I haven't seen that in a long time. Probably Might be worth rewatching because of a uh, reality TV, etc. Welcome to Teaching Tangents, season two, episode eight. Welcome. Where Willem is challenged to answer a question by me, James, usually from a pupil, although we are calling out for questions. Yes, so if you we get are. A, if you go to jamesdesouza.com and click on the link that says teaching challenges, a call for questions, you can submit a question. And really, we want to try and stump Willem because he's a guy who's very rarely <laughs> lost for words. Because he's got a bazillion ideas going around in his head all the time. Good luck trying to stump him. So far, no dice. The more specific the questions are, the better. Yeah, such as, should but, you I shave mean, your head or not? <laughs> yeah, sure. Exactly. We were just we, talking about that before we hit the record button. We were just so, talking about Yeah, qu real questions. Yes. So like, it, it doesn't have to be super specific, like where, but I don't know. Even, you know, where have I put my keys? That would be an interesting, that, <laughs> I mean, this is the whole point of teaching tangent. You start off with, and you go off on tangents and explore. Yeah. That's what we're really encouraging, exploration of thinking and ideas. And it could be, but I, you make a good point about make it a real question, not yeah. just a pretend kind of. Yeah, make it like, make it a real question you have so that if, but mm -hmm. also because, well, if it's a real question you have, like whoever you you are listening to this, watching this, it feels like we we may well be helpful to you or interesting. Yeah. That's one, and also because if you have that question, it's very possible that other people have the same yeah. question or a similar question, and so we're we're hitting multiple. Oh, well, hopefully uh, we're being of interest to more than one person, to our very currently very niche audience of this widely unpromoted show that I, I really don't do enough to promote and I say that every week but um, you know I, I, I do I do have fun doing it with you so yeah and it's building it's building something we're actually creating something that's you know that's the thing I'm most proud is the wrong word most kind of at home with and happy about is I'm actually creating something totally. there's not it's not just like talking about so many of the people I teach, they talk about things, but I think more than ever, there's opportunities for young people to do anything, create a business, make money, do something, create something that has an impact on other people. Yeah. Certainly I don't, I never even thought about anything like that when I was their age. I don't even know if, I mean, I suppose it's possible, but it's not really as accessible. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. No, totally. And I, I know what what, and we may have said this. I can't remember if we really talked about it while streaming, actually, because um, we are technically streaming because um, we're live, I guess. But anyway, the uh, it really, I really enjoy the conversations. Mm, so oh, that's too. also why I'm like, okay, well, it doesn't really matter if not that many people watch it ultimately. But it also gives me a lot of structure. So talking with you every week and having that regular meeting is encouraging me to read is encouraging me to do a bunch of other stuff that we talk about mm. uh that if i didn't have a regular scheduled something with somebody else uh who not that you're counting on it but i figure that it, it really helps me keep on track with a certain amount of things mm. uh so at the moment for example reading and talking about my reading and wanting to read more stuff to make sure i have more ideas and to keep on track with some of my objectives and you're really good at a lot of or you i feel you're better than me at a lot of getting things done in productivity stuff. So I'm kind of just taking some of it by osmosis, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, thank you. And I think that's partly because I, whichever way you cut it, being a teacher is demanding and I don't want to have teaching creep over and take over my entire life. So I have to be very focused about the way I use my time yeah. and this gives me something and hopefully supports my pupils, which is really what I'm about, contributing to other people. And yeah. I know you are too. Yeah. And I think you are going to like today's question. Awesome. I hope so anyway, because this is a, so normally most of the questions are from pupils I teach who tend to be older. Mm -hmm. 
So probably 16 and over. Yeah. This question is from someone slightly younger because my form group, my tutor group are a bit younger. So he's in year 10. He's in the, his first year of GCSEs. Okay. So really kind of young. And I thought this is a great question. And the question is for this week, when do you do what you want to do and not have to abide by the rules? Okay. When do you do what you want to do and not have to abide by the rules? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure where to start on that one. Um, it's a funny way to ask the question. The, uh, what, do you know any background of like what they were focusing on? Like I, I can't get to do what I want to do or. I, I think it's a, uh, I, I, so we, yes, last week was our first week back at school after lockdown. Yeah. And so we've done a complete week and it was challenging, tiring, all of that for me as a teacher. But I think it's a, on the one hand, I think he wants to, he wants to be in school. He wants to do really well. At the same time, he gets frustrated with following rules and structures. And there's this kind of tension between... Sorry, can I interrupt you? I apologize. Yeah, sure. There's a bumping noise, and I think it's you, because I'm literally not moving. <clears throat> like it's doing like... Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. It's either like your chair or the table or your elbow on the table or something along those lines. Okay. I don't know. Is what that it? No. Is this it? Uh, maybe, but I don't think so. No. Okay, it seems to have stopped. I think it was I was doing it while you were talking in a way that was, I think, was distracting. Distracting. I, th I think I might have been knocking my desk, and my desk isn't very stable. Probably because yeah, I, I can do that with my desk a lot, and my desk is not very stable. And this, uh, I, we have the same mic, and it picks up. Um, it does pick up everything. It picks up everything. I'll be, I'll be more aware. So I think, I think his question is driven by he wants, he knows about school, he knows he wants to do well, but he can see that there's opportunity and he doesn't know how to balance it. When should he, and he knows some people in schools, schools are just rules, follow the rules. See, I told you about this that I'm reading because I've been progressing on all my books. I thought I'd uh, finished one of them, but I started reading other stuff. Uh, this is so good. Discipline and punish in English. Uh, and it's talking about, I'm in the chapter where he talks about uh, the chapter is called the docile. Uh, Do you say docile in, yeah, in English? Yeah, 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 yeah docile yeah. bodies. The whole idea is in this chapter he talks about a restructure of uh, of um, in the late 16th all the way to the early 19th century throughout the 18th century mm -hmm. uh, a restructure of discipline and surveillance to train the body and to train bodies, souls, and minds in a certain way. And by that, I mean, that's when they started reorganizing the space schedules uh, and locations for schools, uh, for schools, for factories, for uh, churches, for convents, for military. That's where they started, they started by having military bar barracks, uh, as in wow. to, 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 so they reorganized spaces to have, so for example, there's like a, a bunch of paragraphs about schools Mm -hmm. to train people so that they would keep in line and get what we what power wants done from a young age we're going to tell them you need to sit here at this time in this class yeah. and you need to do this at this time and have a very regulated schedule yeah. and that's where the institution of school started out on which was all about like if we train the bodies and the minds mm -hmm. they will conform to a certain mm -hmm. space and we will be able mm -hmm. to get done what we want to get done Mm -hmm. And you start we, school we so being the power. We being the power. Yeah, the man. <clears throat> yeah, the man. Because it's a, it's an informed like the, he's not accusing anybody because it's the, you can't put it down to one person. Mm -hmm. But he's analyzing how it's interesting that the system has changed, and one of the ways in which the system has changed is to uh, benefit the powers that be, for the masses to be conforming to a certain amount of things, and this is not even necessarily the masses at this point because not everybody's going to school. But it's generally the masses in so far as the same way that somebody would be working in a factory. So mm -hmm. the factory, that's when they started uh, organizing an interior architecture and space yep. so that yep. 
Everybody yeah. has their space. And it was very important, yeah. whether you're a pupil or a uh, somebody working in a factory, you need mm -hmm. to, there's a specific schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a specific spot for you. You do not move from that spot and you have a mm -hmm. specific schedule, which is still the same case at school, uh, or at least in, um, in, I believe, primary school. I mean, at least uh, when I was in primary school, I had my desk. So I had my mm -hmm. assigned place and spot. Mm -hmm. and there was a time mm -hmm. that I was supposed to be there. Now, what's mm -hmm. still true in school is um, there's rows and uh, everybody's mm -hmm. seated and you are mm -hmm. performing to a particular schedule. Mm -hmm. And the schedule and the way it works molds you in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and it molds there's you also... in a certain way. To, and so when I was talking about the factory, the factory is organized in a wide open space with a high up person that is uh, the yeah. manager who can oversee everything in the yep. same way that the teacher can see the whole class. Yep. Uh, and at the time, by the way, they, they were like, like very large classes and they were organized with <laughs> the rich, the poor, uh, the different spots. And there, um, there were very like classes of 300 by groups of 10. Oh, that was, that was a super interesting detail. That was a French school. Uh, it was organized in, um, so like, the class was, so there were, I think, what, well, hundreds, like 300. So very like huge, mm -hmm. but organized in groups of 10 split between two big groups one were the romans the other one was were the greeks and so to mm -hmm. each group of 10 there's a group leader and uh, and they have an opposed group so they're always wow. competing wow you're always all your grades and all your work is competing with a, an equal like other just group of 10 that we've assigned you to like these are your rivals and we're going to we're going to compare you all the time to force competition and to force, uh, well, stress and surveillance and uh, not, it's not to force stress. Stress was one of the consequences. But the whole idea being, well, we need to, we need to, well, the whole idea being that this is the same time in the 19th century, well, mm -hmm. 18th century from the Renaissance. And this is coming from his other book, uh, The Order of Things, Michel Foucault, mm -hmm. uh, where he talks about classifying things. So we'll mm -hmm. circle back because we are talking about the rules, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, totally, yeah where he talks about this, that era of being the scientific discoveries and classification. Because mm -hmm. those are the big areas where we started classifying, um, like doing big- Animals, like big, biology. Yes, big breakthroughs in science. It's not the first time things were classified because the Greeks, like Aristotle did that. I'm listening to a philosophy podcast, but there was wide groundbreaking, let's phase and organize everything and put it into boxes because we need to be more efficient because there was the rise of, uh, of bourgeoisie, of big company owners, mm -hmm. of property. It's also mm -hmm. the time where he talks about the crimes that are more heavily punished are no longer the ones that affect people's bodies, but people's property. Property. Uh, and so property became a, more of a thing. And so that's also why the property owners were like, well, I don't want to be stolen from. So I need more things to be organized in such a way that nobody steals from me, including mm -hmm. my employees, including, mm -hmm. you know, so I want people to be more productive. So how are they going to be more productive? Well, we're going to put them in rows. We're going to watch over them. We're going to make sure they have a very strict schedule. So they have to keep to it. And anybody who walks out of the rank is going to be just tapped on so that they, you know, the whole, and we grew up, we grow up in that. Yep. Through school. So all the rules part of the rule certainly and so and one of the ways and I, I was that's was asking because I was wondering if that was the case particularly if it's a bit of a younger person I don't know but we can talk about it uh when you're growing up on, on another thing that occurs is you can't get to do what you want yeah and and you're like well why why do I have to do those things that seem to have no make the meaningless they make no sense yep and the truth is they do not the yep. truth is, there is no answer. They are built to make you conform to a certain amount of things because you wild child need to be put into certain ranks. And there's also, there's, there's also, no, there's a little bit of a cynical perspective, not necessarily, but there's, it's, there's, there is some truth to it, but there's also a side of like your responsibility. I, we are the grown ups responsible. We know it's better for you and you do not. Because there is a point where a small child, a toddler, particularly toddlers, have like mm. no consciousness of any danger and will mm. just like happily go and throw themselves in fire without if you I know that talking to parents, I'm not a parent, but but I have been with my nieces at the, and nephew at that age. Yeah. Where you're literally turn around and, and he's open the <clears throat> he's up in the drawers and pulling knives out. You're like, whoa, 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 okay, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah. Um, so there is a bit of an extension to 
like the grown-ups know what is better for you child you need to conform so that you are trained and i don't have to worry about you hurting yourself or doing anything that shouldn't be done whatever the whatever the frames of the society culture family you yeah. live in because that can change yeah the the things to be done or not done are can change from one family to another from one country to another from so um so th so so i think there's this association immediately with like there's a certain amount of rules that make it i can't do what i want because my first idea was like wait sometimes you do things that you want to do that are perfectly fine within the rules but we are taught that we are taught mm -hmm. to stay within our lanes mm -hmm. that there is like well the glass ceiling or all sorts of other stuff so that we you know it's that that um analogy story that is told a lot in coaching of like how do you train a uh, a circus fleet ah uh, yeah you yeah know that one you know how do you yeah, train a I circus do. flea is you know the flea jumps uh, but so how do you train it to jump to a certain height so that you can do tricks i mean this is made up but it's not for real but you put it in a glass box and it's going to hit itself on a ceiling and at some point it'll just jump lower and that's the point where you could pull off the ceiling and it won't come out of the box it'll just jump to a certain height which is the analogy of the glass ceiling that is talked about in multiple areas but particularly mm -hmm. well this week was women's um international women's day international Monday. women's day so i hesitated for a hot second because i told the word in french i said it was women's day and somebody corrected me with it was like no that's not the right phrasing be careful like you need to do the right phrasing and i think in, in french it's like the international day of the rights of women or something like that. Okay. women's rights sorry okay no anyway uh, that glass ceiling is talked about in terms of like limiting the progress and opportunity for women and or for anybody who's discriminated against um so you hey, said a lot there. This question. Just, i said a lot yeah yeah but, but it's worth uh, just a couple of points yeah, i want sure. to make about it that i think your what you've just said is another profound thing you said about schools and the way schools are and why the why schools are to phrase it that way what i find interesting is when i've mentioned these kinds of things to other teachers even philosophy teachers, it's no schools are good. Schools, the, the schools help young people. Schools allow young people to explore ideas and whatever. I, I never said at any point that they were not good. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. But I'm saying they're not good. Uh, <laughs> schools as a teacher. And the, I'm, well, actually, I'm not even saying good or bad. I'm, to be fair, I'm just saying that essentially my job as a teacher is to have young people conform to a role so they'll do what they're told yeah. and when i've talked about that with other teachers other teachers say what do you know no we're getting young people ready for the world so that they can go and participate in society and do great things and i'm yeah, like really, this is exactly that yeah <laughs> <laughs> really and the, when i say stuff like that the there's no questioning of the actual structure itself which is a very difficult thing to do to be fair it and is, what yeah. i think what i think you've done there is outline a very you've actually articulated it way better than i can in a in a way that gives that sounds really cool because you're stolen from michel foucault a philosopher so yeah a I, I was about philosopher. to say yeah you, you've just referred to one of the is he probably one of the greatest philosophers of the last century yeah yeah think? totally i mean he's a yeah, he is, he's, he? he's, he's a big figure of the late 20th century yeah, he's he's the yeah. biggest since Sartre, and, and he's uh, actually I started watching a video of him. He recorded a conversation, and, and it's on YouTube with Noam Chomsky. Oh wow! About, which I only started wow. it, which sounds amazing. Like it looks really cool. Chomsky is another one. Like I'm, I have, well, I have a lot of um, gaps in reading, which is what I want to catch up on. And uh, so, but to, so one thing. So on one hand, I'm not surprised that it's difficult to question the institution while you're in the middle of it with other yes. teachers. And I However, do think if I do think if, that's the question. I, do, I think that's what this pupil is trying to do. He's he's trying to do what I'm trying to do as a teacher. Sorry, but yeah, maybe. it's difficult to question as a teacher when you're in the institution. You were saying sorry. Yeah, and uh, and I, but I, it's also a bit sad. And I don't know, I mean, hopefully it's not entirely always the case that you say a philosophy teacher doesn't want to question things because that's the point of philosophy. Yeah. Arguably, the point of philosophy is to take big questions and talk about them to discuss, to discuss and find truths through the discussion. 
through the questioning and the inquiry. Mm -hmm. It's uh, that's the point of philosophy. They take the, you know, just anyway. Um, the um, what was I going to say? Could, can Chomsky. You back, let's go back to the question. Well, before you do, Chomsky, you were going to say something about Chomsky. Oh, I was just going to say, I have not. Oh, I was going to say two things. One, uh, I, I want to read Chomsky and I have not read any, like it's a bit not embarrassing, but could be uh, that I haven't read any. Or at least I talked to other people and my brother were like, yeah, absolutely. You haven't read Chomsky? You totally need to read Chomsky. I watched a couple of interviews because he was very busy on interviews uh, during the pandemic last year, mm -hmm. particularly in mm -hmm. the run up to the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, opening his mouth wide on like we need to get Trump out of there there's no other conversation possible until we do that in his perspective um, and um, so I listened to a podcast called Philosophize This that I knew of, of that I had listened name. to a few episodes it's a great it's a great podcast and he did a recently a couple of episodes on media and one of the episodes is about Chomsky I might have talked about manufacturing consent which is now, one of his big books and his big so theory. I tried reading it. Yeah. And it's the one book that I started reading and I couldn't finish. It's tough the, to read. It's, I found it tough, but maybe that was because it was 20 years ago, maybe, or something. But it's I don't know. It's also possible. <laughs> I, I found it. I, like I started it. I even restarted it and I kept getting through it. I was like, oh, my mind is unraveling here. Because I think it was because I was thinking about is this what the media is doing to me? And I was like, this is scary, scary. So that episode about Chomsky to, uh, of, to philosophize this is yeah. great because so he vulgarizes uh, philosophy, philosophers and their ideas. And he does usually 30 to 45 minute episodes. Hang on, the when you say week, vulgarize, you mean- I mean he accessible. summarizes. Yeah. Sorry, vulgarize yeah. is a, it's a French word. It's a French I know, I know. usage of word, sorry. Uh, it, it means he makes it accessible for people. Yeah. That's what vulgarizing it means. Um, yeah. It's yeah. It would not be the same meaning in English. It's and it's funny because it's in France. It's a it's a it, in common language meaning to make it accessible for people. Yeah. But there is something always a tad pejor pejorative about it. Just yeah. a tiny bit. Yeah. Because you are using the word vulgar. Yeah. And most of the time, the word with vulgar is not used in a good way. Nope. So the French always have a thing like, oh yeah, but making something it's available common. to the masses is not a good thing. Yeah. Even though technically it is a great thing, but that comes back to us like, well, you putting the power into the hands of the people mm -hmm. is a dangerous thing for the people in power mm -hmm. because they want to keep it. But I thought that's what France was all about. Liberty, equality, brotherhood. <laughs> you yeah. do not know France. <laughs> Your, just your face, you the, the way you shook your you head. So don't know France. He, well, hang on. I was taught history. I know about the French Revolution. But yeah, freedom. the French Revolution was the rich people just using the poor to. So it, it, you, a very cynical view of the French Revolution. It's very <laughs> yeah. summarized. Yep. Totally. So do not quote me on this fully because it, you. I would need. To, I, by the way, have realized that I need to do research and understand it better myself a bunch okay. of French history because I should mm -hmm. go back to my school lessons or at the very least reread some Wikipedia pages and probably some books. But in short, part of the big time of the revolution is the king was still in power and mm -hmm. the aristocrats owned the land, but the bourgeoisie mm -hmm. and all the owners are the people who are both well educated. So we had a few of the thinkers there, uh, but also all the people who have all the money and all the business and have everything who are like, well, wait a minute, we have everything, we're developing everything, we own everything, but the aristocrats are still in charge. This is a problem for me now. And the people are hungry, so we're like, well, actually, let's just put the, the poor people against the aristocrats, get rid of them so that we can actually be finally really in power. That's what happened. Another very good summary. So that's you why they always it. talk about you the bourgeoisie. It. I would big time. They talk about <laughs> they talk about the bourgeoisie because that's what happened. It's the bourgeoisie yeah. that overtook the throne to get. Now after that, there was Napoleon and a few other people. But yes, of course, liberté, égalité, fraternité. But in reality, that's like a, one. It's an ideal because there's a whole other deeper conversation that is very interesting when you start listening to philosophy stuff. That you're like, well, is it really? With it, I'm, this is a tangent within a tangent within a tangent. But <laughs> That's the point. Start looking at how people are actually all different. Do we? What does equality really mean? Mm. Mm. Should, so is it? Should we all? And so, the, so 
two things. So philosophize this, and I was looking for podcasts. There's a bunch of the podcasts I usually listen to that are either not publishing as often as they usually do because of difficulties with the pandemic or recording. Mm -hmm. And then there's new stuff. And I started getting bored of like all the current news, uh, people yeah. complaining about COVID or how slow the vaccination is going, et cetera. I was like, oh, I can't, I'm, I don't want to listen to that. Uh, so I was like, I need to, I, I want to listen to something going a little bit more um, just uh, evergreen. Uh, just mm. as I was talking about learning more about classics, mm. deeper stuff, mm -hmm. philosophy, history, like mm -hmm. to go into the kind of knowledge that anyway. And so I was like, wait a minute, that philosophizes this podcast. I haven't listened to that in a while. Let's mm -hmm. just go to the beginning. Yeah. Because it's a chronology. He starts episode one uh, and he started in 2013. There's a, about 150 episodes and he starts with the pre-Socratics and I'm, I've listened to wow. like 15, 16 episodes. Wow. And so I've been I've been going through That's great. the whole ancient ancient wisdom of the Greeks, the Romans, and Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, uh, and all those guys. Diogenes, um, multiple Diogenes, Epicureans, Stoics. That's what I'm listening to at the moment. It's really good. It's really good. I strongly recommend this. The, <clears throat> I strongly recommend it, and it gives you a lot of perspective on a lot of different things, including questions like everything that we're talking about and it's true that some of the philosophy texts can be complicated if you're young they were for me when i was mm -hmm. 18. Mm -hmm. however listening to this guy makes it a lot easier mm. and i'm also interested to get a, a passing knowledge of everything and it will also allow me to have a better idea generally of what's going on overall in terms of just the whole growth of philosophy and all the thought currents Mm -hmm. and decide what do I want to actually read out of what I'm listening to. I'm like, oh, that guy I want to read more of, you know. That's really cool. It sounds or like you're person, getting, but you're getting a kind of, of a general end. approach and then you're going to go in depth on things you're interested in. I'm thinking that, yeah. That's cool. I'm assuming you've read Sophie's World. A long time ago, yeah. Yeah, me too. Actually, that's I, a good one from when you are a kid. I, I totally, that, that one you understand, totally. Yeah, that's a great, actually, I hadn't thought about that book in a long time. It's a great book. Yeah. So let's maybe go back to the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well well before we get back to the question so we've yeah. talked about structures we've thought we talked about hierarchy we talked about the purpose of maybe why oh, things I was are put into order hierarchy i have one more point classifying things and i also want to recommend that program i talked about by adam curtis who talks about so many of the ideas that you've mentioned already the british empire is all about classifying and putting everything into order so it could be more efficient so yes. and same with the, what exactly. happened in china and what happened in america and he, he weaves this kind of visual collage narrative that just appeals to my sense I need to, of i need to look at that making sense of weirdness yeah, i haven't looked at that one it's a six-part series about an hour each one and it's it is a kind of an emotional experience with all the narratives going on. I think it's great. I've only seen two of them, though, because it's quite an intense watch. Cool. But it speaks to what you're saying, what you're vulgarizing. <laughs> and there are tons of stuff that are available. I know, I know, like, if you're listening to this, you might already be having eight hours of school a day, so you might not want to watch more, more on YouTube or listening. Um, because it'll, it'll, you know what, if you listen to this occasionally, it's cool and you can come back to it later. But that, I know there's a bunch of professors that have um, classes and courses that are recorded and they're on YouTube on all sorts of topics. Mm. And the kind of stuff on philosophy and history and on, on talk, talk about history, there's also the Hardcore History podcast that I, I think know. is paid now. I think our, mutual, our now. mutual friend Adam goes on about it. I've never he listened does. to it. I'd listened to a couple of episodes. I am not a huge, I've never become a fan. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people are huge fans of this podcast. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with the guy's voice. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just, his voice annoys me. And so just for anybody who doesn't know it, it's a history podcast. And the guy goes into, like he takes one particular little piece of history and goes into big time depth. So the episodes are about one topic and they go four, like three, four hours more or more long. So they're very long episodes mm. about, so one one that I listened to is about the Khan of Khans. It was about all the, the Khans in Mongolia up to, all the way up to Gen Gen Genghis Khan. Oh, okay. Right, uh, right. And the, that story. Uh, and he does it in a very uh, enthusiastic, 
way. And the guy from Philosophize This, I think, is copies a little bit of that style. Okay. But it's a topic I'm a little bit more interested in. And he cuts them down into more digestible chunks. Because As I'm driving the 20, to school. The 20 to 30 minute episodes for Philosophize This. See, that's perfect. Four hours. Because, because I'm driving to school, I started listening to podcasts again. So I'm going to look at Philosophize This. And it takes yeah. you about half an hour to get to school. Yeah. So I'll, Just so you I'll know, the first few episodes are a bit longer. Mm-hmm. And there's also one thing which he says, because it's, he's like, he did this, it's his first podcast. So he, he gets better as it goes. Of course. But he has there's some interesting choices, like the first few episodes, but he stops after three or four episodes. He has like some weird, um, just rock music in between like segments music that is mm-hmm. just very jarring with what he's talking about. Uh, his idea, he explains after three episodes because people he's uh, people are already complaining, so he takes <laughs> he removes it because it really doesn't work. It just doesn't work with his podcast. <laughs> he's like, well, I thought maybe I, you know my voice would drone on and you'd fall asleep, so maybe to wake you up you could have some of this excited like rock music, uh, but it's actually just jarring because the guy's talking and you're like, well, okay, I don't know what this music is, and plus it's really annoying. It's not very good. It's like very cheap, uh, you know, cheaply bought um, music. Anyway. Doesn't matter. Uh, maybe we should go back to the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you were going to say one thing before we went back to the question. I was going to say one thing, which might, I think it still serves the question a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and this is also from Philosophize This, where he talks about the concept of equality. And uh, one sociologist, Max Weber, uh, who mm-hmm. I read one book about uh, from him, uh, and I, I want to go back to, because he's one of the fathers of sociology, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, he talks about the fact that the more you will, one of the inevitable things in his view is the more you increase equality between people, right? Uh, the more, um, what is the word? Dehumanizing experiences will be or something like that. Because when you make things more equal- oh, Because we become the same. Yeah. So for example, and he used this, I'm stealing the example from the podcast. Okay. So this yeah, is yeah. Uh, from Philosophize This. And it's a silly example, but he says, well, think about the more, the more everybody is equal, Mm-hmm. everybody has the same opportunity mm-hmm. the less you pay attention to everybody's specificities unique situations because everybody's meant to be equal so for example uh-huh. if you go to uh to do an admin thing to renew your driver's license and you have to uh, go and stand in line take a ticket to queue at the um, at the dmv in the states or the driving thing whatever it is in the uk uh dvla yeah, uh, the, the DVLA, that's right. Uh, the DVLA um, or, you know, whatever equivalent of admin thing you have to do that is very standardized. There's forms, there's somebody. Uh-huh. And you go and explain your case. Oh, but, you know, I have this special situation. My mom just died. I need to, you know, I, I need to drive the, to the other side of the country. And uh, anyway, like whatever. I, 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 sorry, I'm not doing this well, but I mean to say like you have a real ur- emergency. Yeah. And a tragedy just happened in your family and you're trying to yeah. explain this to the person. Yeah. But that means you want special, you want special favor. This is true. So you're asking for special favor and that is not equal. That is not equality. If everybody's equal, everybody's treated the same. So if everybody's always treated as the same, there is like the more you tend towards equality for everyone, the more there will be some, uh, de- some kind of dehumanizing experience. Wow. That goes along with the standardization. So yeah, I need to read Max Weber in this idea. I don't know which book it's in, actually, but uh, it's in a recent episode of Philosophize This that I listened to, actually, where he talks about that. Interesting. I'm now so, thinking of Brave New World and Hierarchy and everyone being the same and, you know, do your thing and not being savage and all of that. So it's, it's also a reminder that it is an ideal. Hmm. It's mm-hmm. it, the idea of everybody is equal and the, the um, Declaration of Human Rights, essentially, mm-hmm. are ideas and ideals to tend to, to aim towards. Mm-hmm. But there's also a large body of question where you can totally question, and it's dangerous to question these days because a lot of people, when you start questioning things, well, it's dangerous to question. Um, Nobody has time anymore. Not nobody, of course we do, but you know, it's 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 very easy to have 140 characters or 300, whatever it is on Twitter these days, mm-hmm. to have short, digestible ideas. One minute, thirty segments on 24-hour news. 
Mm -hmm. And you have to talk about very complex stuff, which is the reason why we talk for an hour, because we, mm -hmm. then you realize that after an hour, you barely broached any of the questions that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So how can a three minute segment on TV or a tweet summarize all the different ideas of everything that's going on? You can't. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more. So apparently I saw a headline and this, this is just a headline. So I don't know the exact situation, mm -hmm. uh, but the headline was a, a university professor in the States uh, got fired because they said that they were concerned with the fact that black students didn't have as high grades as uh, their other students. So mm -hmm. apparently, so I didn't read the full article, so I need to check it. But apparently, mm -hmm. to, and she was said she was dismissed for like being racist. But what she was saying was she was talking about disparity and she was concerned. So it was like almost, apparently the opposite. Wow. Okay. So anyway, we're talking about there's a lot of heavy reactions to things that are not really understood if nobody listens these days. So we're going again far from the question. Well, but we the, end up Max, speaking in Newspeak. Huh? We end up speaking in Newspeak. Everything is that kind of broken down, short kind of idea rather than thinking things through. Yeah, and there's, there's you know possible areas oh we didn't talk about the t-shirts um no we didn't but that's okay it's okay we uh there's possible areas where you're um, I, you know what i don't want to go there well let's go back to the question <laughs> okay we'll come back to so the question when do you do what you want to do and not have to abide by the rules well so here's the funny thing like the very straight up answer and sorry that it's after 35 minutes if you're not abiding by the rules and you do what mm -hmm. you want, there is no time, there is no when. It's like whenever you're ready to break the rules. Mm. And I'm not saying you should at all, by the way. Mm -hmm. I am not, this is not an encouragement for you to go break the rules and do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But the question is, when is it the time? You're like, well, there's, there's no time. At some point you break a rule and you do whatever. Assuming that what you want to do is, is outside the bounds of the rules you were given. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the question assumes. If you want to do something that is within the rules, well, th then there's no question. Just ideally to most people and most of what we're trained for, and this is all the first part of what we talked about, yeah. is for everybody to abide by the rules so that we have a society that works in an ideal fashion and that rule breaking is only an exception. And if you break the rules in a way that deserves uh, punishment or if you get caught, you'll get the appropriate punishment. Whether it's, you know, <clears throat> presumably your parents told you you need to be home by a certain time mm -hmm. and you're not home by the time your parents were given, you know, you're going to get a consequence. So you either get home discreetly and you've broken the rules, you did what you wanted to do, which was stay out later uh, until 11. I don't know, I'm making this up. Uh, all the way to, you know, to doing something completely illegal as a grown up or even as a kid, mm. rob a bank. You know, you, that is like, you, I want to go rob a bank, so I'm going to go and rob a bank. That is not allowed. You're not supposed to go rob a bank. It's definitely outside of the bounds of the rules. I yeah. do not encourage you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make this abundantly clear in case anybody just decides to take this small bit and go like, well, I just told everybody to go rob a bank. Um, no, he didn't. I did not say that. And he I'm didn't say talk, that. I'm going to talk very fast and keep just going one word to the other so that you have a difficulty editing it anyway. Fortunately, nobody watches this or very few people do. Um, so when is it a good time? So you're like, well, I really want to go rob a bank. When is a good time to go rob a bank, even though it's against the rules? I'm like, I can't tell you when's a good time for that. I mean, you're going to have to sort that one out for yourself, man. Uh, and it's very interesting that I'm reading. Uh, where is it? Oh, I left it in my room. I'm reading a, <clears throat> almost at the end of a, a collection of graphic novels called Criminal that were won a bunch of awards. Yeah. Ed Brubaker yeah. and Sean Phillips, highly recommended. Um, and they're independent stories. Each one is like a quite long story. Mm -hmm. um, they're, I mean, they're all <clears throat> different stories of criminal life. Okay. They're quite fairly dark, usually. Uh, they're really good. They, they're, not, they're not interconnected. You do oh. have some similar characters who come through from one story to the other that are all revolving around each other because this happens in the same city. Mm -hmm. But each story is taking a completely different perspective on crime, essentially. Different types of crimes, different types of criminals, different types of stuff that happens to them, different types of consequences. This sounds right on my street. 
And, it, and it's very interesting because there's one area of this question that can be answered well. There's a whole side of life that is like the people who do not respect the rules at all. They're called criminals. Mm -hmm. So I recommend that book to check out uh, the kind of uh, well fictional, like crazy stuff that can happen to criminal life and what, you, what you're engaged in. It's usually not necessarily, I mean, there's a lot of desperation there as well. And not necessarily people who've happily chosen a life of crime, you know. Um, uh, so, but back to the idea of the simple and probably more closer to your students or pupils, like your parents give you a certain amount of bounds, uh, of boundaries or stuff that you're supposed to do. And there's a certain amount of consequences or not for not doing mm -hmm. them. And it is also true that uh, even though I was talking about the, the construction of rules, regulations that fit yep. you in a certain a mold, it is also true that there's a lot of value in that because you give structure yeah. to somebody and having structure helps because having yeah, structure it does. allows you to get things done. It does. That's it, All this stuff was done in the name of productivity. And we were talking, and I was talking about how I like the fact that you're quite productive. You have rules and structures for you mm. getting things done, right? Mm -hmm. And you can read books and we've talked about this on this show. So those are rules and structures that you give to yourself because it, it makes getting things done easier. And I know I've just like said that it's in the name of a book, but it, it's, a, it's not the, it's but not the, the purpose. But the the I, I think of two things when you talk about structures and boundaries. I think of the experience of a parent giving boundaries to children, mm -hmm. but then also the rules or the structures that I give myself. Yeah. There's something more empowering about creating rules for yourself that you follow that gives yeah. you some kind of agency to be more effective and productive. Yeah. But there's another thing when yeah. someone else is imposing the boundaries on you as a parent or me as a teacher. And I, I wonder if what's another shade of the question being mm -hmm. some pupils, it seems like everybody knows when every, when something is unfair, like right. they instinctively know. So if they're treated one way because of the application of a rule, but someone else behaves another way, but the rule doesn't apply to them, instantly, instantly, there's a reaction. And, and there's, there's philosophers have researched those kinds of questions on fairness as well. Yeah. Do you they? think that's okay. another area? Do you think that's what part of what we're, part of what is being questioned? I think here? it might be because it comes up a lot in school, and you know, you might have one individual with some individual because and it goes back to what you said about equality if everyone's treated the same then any kind of individual situation is not allowed for you have to follow the, mm -hmm. the structure and there's this tension between those two things certainly in school certainly in a classroom everywhere is that yeah it's there's, everywhere we have tons of tensions because if, if anybody's ready to look and most of the time we don't because it takes a little bit of time and mental effort mm -hmm. every one of us holds contrary and contradictory beliefs Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we hold them together at the same time. And if you pull things apart, you're like, wait a minute, I believe in X, but also in Y. And those can't be true at the same time. And um, we're back to George Orwell with doublethink. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I believe that all men and, and women and everybody are, are equal in rights. Mm -hmm. I will also happily tell somebody life's not fair. Mm -hmm. And... Both of those are true at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to take a more extreme example, sure. I sound and was brought up white middle class. I went oh. to a grammar school, went, lived, brought up in a great area, went to university, you know, parents with a car, had a car, had a house, parents still together, all those kind of things. But I look not that especially when my beard gets really long and I'm dressed a certain way. And like I was, I went for a walk with my sister last week in Epsom Downs, really wonderful area. We're walking along and this guy looked at me as we're walking straight in the eye, kind of confrontationally a little bit aggressive. And I, I didn't lower my gaze. I deliberately went sideways and carried on because lowering your gaze can be like a submissive thing. This is something that I picked up from doing Krav Maga, the martial art. And as we were walking, walking on, carry on walking, my sister was like, he looked at you. I was like, yeah, he's just like curious or whatever, looking at my hat or whatever. And my sister was like, no, 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 because you're brown, because you look foreign. You know, and in that particular area where we're, where we were walking, there is a certain amount of 
that kind of tension between anyone who's different. Yeah, but the person going, do you belong here? Exactly. But the, there's that kind of like, I sound a certain way and look completely different. Mm-hmm. Like I am this in contradiction and I've kind of like embrace it. Yeah. But it's a, how do you live in a world that's, and you're making me think, what's it like for a pupil when they follow the rules and they're fine and they don't get any, like, you know, they don't get into trouble. Someone else doesn't follow the rules, gets into trouble, but it seems like the teachers like them, but it seems like they get more attention or it seems like they're not, the rules don't apply to them. That's got to be incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Do you, have you ever heard of the talk? As in what I mean by that, and I don't know much about it, but I know Procter & Gamble did a really quite emotional ad movie about it. And uh, and then because of no. that, I learned that there was a thing. And of course, there's a random white guy I didn't know. The talk is is black parents, black American, black uh, African-American parents talking to their kids about how it is going to be. Dealing to be with black the police? In America. Or in general? In general, while it is, you know, you're going to have to work, hard. you might have to work harder than others. You're going to have to be careful when the police is going around because they're going to pick you up more than others. And when and how and what to say is is a, a, a um, from what I understand, because I'm, I'm not very knowledgeable on the topic, from what I understand is a is a big area of discussion and an area of inquiry for, for parents in America of, of African descent or Black American parents to talk about i like mm. should we talk about it at what age what do we say because there's also like if you talk about it then you make it a reality but it is also a reality so what do you want to impose at your at your child how do you talk about that when how you know all that uh is a big i had that of, talk like, from my dad you know yeah there you go my, my dad said that my dad would talk about how that. old were you i think i was uh el- the phrase my dad used was, we are a minority of a minority. Mm. And I think I must have been about 12. I think I was the minority moving. of minority you are? So what he means is, we're brown. Yeah. So we're brown within, what to use those terms, that it, the moment I say brown, it will automatically creates the separation. We're, we're not part of the majority. That was in the sense of, I'm not like my friends, I'm not English, whatever, white English. And then he would say, even amongst brown people, even amongst that, the people who look of Indian origin, we're a minority because I was brought up Catholic. So I'm not Hindu or Muslim or Sikh or Mm. like that. So we are a minority of that smaller minority, which confuses people even more. Yes, occasionally I'll have pupils ask me, how come your name is James? Like, and the implication is it's an anglicized version of an Asian name. You know, we have South Koreans who a lot of South Korean population near where, near where I live. And we have South Korea, quite a significant South Korean population in school. And they will anglicize their Korean name. So, you know, Peter, Paul, Carl, those kind of names. But their, their South Korean name will be different. Woo Jin. Sangjin, all, all kinds of names like that. So people, they're confused when I say my name is James. And they're confused when they say, when I say I was brought up Catholic. There's, there's confusion there. And there's even more confusion when I say I love heavy metal. I've had people say like, yeah. why do you like that white music? I'm like, okay. And it's, it's that, the knowing that and having the talk, it's a really great way of saying it actually, the it, it does acknowledge the reality of the situation. And then, of course, my sister and I were like low grade angry all the time because we knew the reality, but we didn't want to accept it. Mm. So we just became annoyed all the time. And, that, and that's just one way of responding to, oh, here are the rules. Here are the structures. I want to break it all up and smash it all up, which I, I don't know. If te- I don't know. Do all teenagers go through that? Is that a natural stage? Well, I thought it was, but then you told me that your students were more preoccupied with wanting to make money and having a business. Some of the older ones are. They don't want to destroy. Or something they, like that. They don't I, seem... I, I thought it was, but uh, but maybe not. I don't know. They I, don't I know that there's some form... As angry as I was. I believe that there's some form of, uh, of rejection, but it depends what you re- want to reject, I guess, as a did teenager. You, did you go through that? Were you like that? That teenage angst kind of thing? Oh, yeah, sure. 
well, teenage angst. I, I mean, I sure I wanted to overthrow things. I wanted to, you know. Oh, because you went to protests and everything. You yeah. did that properly. Yeah, and I went to. I've been going to protests the last few days. There's a small protest that just started. And it's because it's next door. Uh, there, there's a group. There's a group of artists occupying a theater, and there's three theaters that have been occupied. And I wonder if more have been occupied mm-hmm. this weekend. Uh, because the government, there's two things. One, all the people working in uh, culture and arts mm-hmm. are screwed completely after a mm-hmm. year of not being able to work. Mm-hmm. And the government just announced that they were not going to sub- stop. They were going to stop supporting those people uh, in some way. I can't remember exactly how. But mm-hmm. um, and then secondly, the government also recently announced that they're <laughs> they're, they're fascinating uh, in the midst of a pandemic with a lot of people struggling. Uh-huh. They're changing the way they count uh, and and tally unemployment benefits. So rather than trying to pass a new law that would be a big bill and that would be a big complicated mess because it would be argued, yeah. they're saying like, oh well, let's just change the count. And the change yeah. of the count would mean near like eight hundred and fifty thousand people lose twenty percent of their employment benefits, unemployment benefits. Wow. And then a further. I, I can't, I'm not sure of the exact number, but several hundred thousand people would lose their unemployment benefits entirely. And for the future, you would have to work longer to re- get any un- unemployment benefits in the future. Uh, now, to do this right now, when a lot of people are struggling and have lost their jobs, is, uh, I mean, you got to... But that's amazing. interesting because it, it goes back to rule. Just so that's why the they're rules. occupying a theater and there's music every afternoon mm-hmm. uh, and they're trying to... All the, the people from culture and arts are saying that, you know, we need to do something and there's so they're occupying that theater and they're staying there and they're having events and music and talks and like that. Because you know, that's... Very dangerous Islamo-lefty as they're calling these guys in France at the moment. Islamo-lefty? Oh, well, that's the That's the topic. phrase? We're, yeah, wow there's a okay. there's a big witch hunt of a phrase that was made up called there's and the, the phrase was first used never Talk defined about of course conflating two things together that just so 24 seemed... hours news channels and mainstream news are and I, I can send you articles about it are chasing islamo lefties and islamo leftism in france as a dangerous wow. thing whoa okay uh, there was <laughs> yeah no, I mean, there was like the minister of uh, of higher education was questioned a few weeks ago. That was another scandal. I'll send you some articles about this whole thing. It's crazy. Um, it started a few months ago. It's it's a big big time witch hunt from the right and extreme right uh, as a to keeping just witch hunting, witch hunting anybody who's questioning anything coming from any side of like being. Well, they're saying so. The question was so: Are you doing it? <laughs> it's an amazing question in a twenty four hour news? I think it was like the more kind of ex- right extreme right news channel. Uh, a la Fox News type thing and the question was uh, so what is being done in the midst of universities to uh, watch out for Islamo lefty tendencies and she was like yeah it's it's and she answered she's like well, she didn't bat an eye and started saying yes absolutely something we're very concerned about so then the next the next cycle of news was like the rise of Islamo lefty and researchers and university professors that are a hotbed for Islamo leftism uh, oh all these God. dangerous intellectuals and it was an intellectual witch hunt that started on like on. all the people that dangerous things. intellectuals they spent time <laughs> on the 24-hour news channels taking uh like thesis uh titles from students who are doing phds and stuff on sociology mm-hmm. or whatever and mm-hmm. pulling the title apart and saying well what is that we don't even understand what it is and like a, a, what you would criticize the americans for being into anti-intellectual they were doing mm-hmm. that in france they're doing that in France now, right now. So much for liberty, equality, and brotherhood. Mm-hmm. Wow. But this goes right back to the question. The, the rules. <laughs> I, I'll, ta- I'll, I'll make the Please connection. Please do, because right? I'm like, I'll I make the connection. far away. No, it ha- we haven't. You know what you were saying about the reclassifying the unemployment mm-hmm. benefits? That's just like, oh, let's rewrite the rules. Let's yeah. just change the rules. Do you remember? And then immediately... Things change. And things and change. Then let's, in the West let's Wing, there's a great episode of the, of the West Wing where they talk about uh, the, the number of poor people in the country. Mm-hmm. And, and then they're like, well, how is poor defined? Oh, well, actually, if we just redefine what poor means, then we have a lot less poor people. 
You just like yeah. all of a sudden from overnight reduced the level of poverty in the US in the fictional TV show. But this is the same thing. With but that Amy happened Blum. in reality. They did that in the yeah, UK. In reality, yeah. they reclassified yeah. what counts yeah. as someone being on the poverty level. Yeah. And then you have the people in charge going, we just uh, we just uh, yeah, yeah. Reduced, reduced poverty by 20%. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, well, wait a minute. There's still the same number of people earning the same amount of money and probably struggling. You just change the count. Mm. I think this does. So this is how it links to the question. The rules are the structure. The rules are the way things are set up. The rules are the hierarchy. The rules are the stay in your lane. But if the rules get rewritten, then everything changes. And you've just given a whole, we've given a whole set of examples of how the, well, not only how the rules can change, but also how the rules are set. 24 hour news can almost set the agenda and set the rules and set the conversation uh, the media does that and that's we don't even think about that some i'm I'm, i don't even know if younger people even think about that certainly in a school whenever they try and question every anything it's really hard for most teachers to want to engage with it's like no why should i do that because i told you to so here's a way to tie everything together to the question yeah you are given, we, you, everybody is given a certain amount of structure and rules and things you need to follow mm-hmm. to, because it's believed that that is the way the life and everything will work better if you follow those rules. Mm-hmm. Now, there might be consequences if you break them, but there's also a whole other side of what you said that part of the idea is for anybody listening to this and who asked the question, the sooner you start making your own rules. Mm. And the sooner you start going, well, actually, here is what works for me. And part of growing up and being a teenager, I think, is to start to have an opportunity to 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 understand that and to understand that you can start making your own rules within the rules. Mm -hmm. The sooner you regain power over them, because Mm -hmm. otherwise you 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 are like the kind of low grade angry that you were describing earlier because you are a a, uh, your. um, Ah. I can't think of the word in English. You're submit. You're submitted to the rules. You are uh, at, at, at the at the effect of. Okay. You're at the effect of the rules, and you don't have power over them. But mm-hmm. if you have them for your, if you make them yours, then they're yours. You've consciously chosen what they are. Mm-hmm. Now there's a bunch of stuff that you're born into that is entirely imposed, like that you probably won't have a lot of influence over, or not anytime soon, like the laws of the country, rules of the road when you're driving. But the sooner you say, well, I am somebody who will abide by those rules because I understand that the country has set them to make things work, Mm -hmm. then you're doing what you want. Because you chose it, Mm -hmm. you're reversing the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not easy and it takes looking at everything in a certain way. And until you can do that, you probably have to abide by the rules just because. But the sooner you go, oh, wait a minute, what is the rule? Is it something I want to do? I can say I want to do it. It's not being done to me. Mm -hmm. And that just what I said can deserve, like deserves a bunch of episodes. And there's a lot of work to get to that small point. Yeah. It's totally intellectual, but uh, just like you'll get the cerebral point. But I think that's the best way to answer the question at this point. It's like, when can, when can I get to do what I want uh, and not abide by the rules? Was it? Yeah, it was. When, when do you do what you want to do and not have to abide by rules? Right. You never do. So you either, what I said earlier, break the rules whenever you break the rules mm-hmm. and do whatever you want. That's up to mm-hmm. you. That's, mm-hmm. I'm not encouraging you to do that necessarily. Uh, but the sooner you make the rules yours and make your own rules, mm. then you do what you want without having to break the rules because you just made them yours. Mm-hmm. Can I have a go at rephrasing the way you said it? Cause it's, yeah, because uh, it's not the best way. I'm trying to do it on the fly and there were words that were like missing. So yes, if you- So yes. what, what I get from that is something that I relate to, which is to take the question, when, when do you do what you want to and not have to abide by the rules? Is that when I understand the rules as they are for what they are, and even, in, even the reasoning behind them and I can follow them, then I'm in a position to start creating new ones or changing them. Mm-hmm. A bit, I, I suppose, to bring it back to another thing about games. When you know the rules of the game, then you can change them. 
when you when you understand if, if i'm gonna oh, there's also just the first thing to play the game you need to know the rules and, and play by the rules to be able to play the game and, at all and mm -hmm. enjoy the game mm -hmm. and when you play a game some people cheat but that's not part of enjoying the game some people enjoy cheating but you're usually ruining the fun for others mm -hmm. yeah it has a consequence so it's so, before you don't change the rules of the game first you just play with the rules yeah then you can well, design will, your own game so, that's interesting you said that, that that phrase play with the rules could be seen two ways you could say play according to the rules or you could say play with the rules mess them around and change them around like play with them play with the rules bring play to it there's a two little nuances to that phrase play with the sure. rules and the in school it is very much based on structure and rules and society schools are a reflection of society all of that and understanding the rules and the consequences if you break them i think there's freedom in that yeah if you understand that and that's what's allowed me to i can acknowledge my low-grade anger because and own it instead of just being low-grade angry all the time and being ending up ill yeah <laughs> and you can use that you can use that energy towards something else than um then uh, you can use it to forward and further something positive yes. rather than it having affecting your mood in a negative way which is the low grade anger which is typically a negative uh, negative effect and i do want to i think the way i think the way to wrap it up and end it is by considering how play can bring something positive to the situation with rules yeah and how we do with it oh my phone's going off that's not cool i'll just turn that off the bringing play to this question when do you do what you want to do and not have to abide by the rules the yeah. there is Bringing something play about is play and and questioning and exploring and adventure and having fun with it i yeah. think there's something within something to and that. you know what you, if back to the thing of fairness sometimes you'll witness things that are not going by the rules and like you, you can you know decide what to do at that particular point because we're also emotional creatures and teachers are as well they don't you know do the same thing and we don't we're not always we're not machines so we're not always causing the same cause and effect and the same results and you will observe things that you think are a certain way and maybe you'll see them some other way anyway but i should have shut up that was not a good way to keep i'm not sure that was useful so anyway we're more emotional we want we're more emotional. questions yeah so that's how we'll end up so yes. thank you for the question and we want more questions question. yeah it's a great question go to you can go to james com. click on teaching tangents searching for questions i think that's the name of the link teaching tangents to call for questions or have a look at villains facebook twitter all over the internet eventually it'll be spreading on my instagram as well and give us questions and we'll Great. start to widen the conversation because awesome. i think questioning everything is a good thing yes thank you